1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 12 and reading through verse 20. The word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized, into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, Where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, Where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. Amen. Amen. Annie Garcias, Garcias, I don't know how to pronounce your name exactly. We're happy to have you with us today as well. Amen. I see your name there. If you'll bow your heads with me one more time. Father, today, God, once again, we humble ourselves in the presence of the mighty King. And we ask God today that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest today, O oh God, upon both the speaker and the hearer. Lord, the Word of God going forth is a divine exercise. If all it were were men's feeble efforts at conveying divine truth, it would fall flat upon the ground and would accomplish nothing. But we understand, O oh God, when the presence and the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost rides upon the wings of love and carries the word of God forward as the preacher delivers that which has been given him by the Holy Ghost. Lord, that anointing delivers, that anointing saves, that anointing breaks the bondage and the yoke of sin and unbelief. It delivers from addiction. It brings us out, O oh God, of the traps and the tears and the wiles of the enemy. O oh God, we need the anointing today. We need the anointing today, God, more than ever. We have needed the anointing. The Word of God teaches that that day shall not come, except first there come a great falling away. And today, oh God, so many in your church have fallen away. They've fallen after political influence. They've fallen after secular influence. They've fallen after economic influence. Their interests are everything but spiritual. And Lord, today I have no desire, none whatsoever, to preach a message that would appeal to the masses. But my desire, O oh God, is to preach a word that would minister to the sincere, that would minister to those people today, O oh God, who genuinely want to hear from heaven. Help us today, O oh God, to minister the word of God effectively, clearly, powerfully, in love, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Glory to God. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. 
The Word of God tells us today, according to the Apostle Paul, in his first epistle to the church at Corinth, that the body of Christ is made up of many members, we may not all look the same, we may not all act the same, we may not all function the same, but we are nonetheless members of the body of Christ. I know there are people today in the Christian world who would much rather prefer that Pastor Burnett Morrow not even exist. <laughs> I know there are some today who would prefer that churches like ours didn't even exist, that we weren't even preaching the reconciling, reconstructive, powerful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ in an affirming and inclusive manner. That's all right. They can wish we didn't exist all they want to. You can wish that the soles of your feet didn't exist because they hurt from time to time. You could wish that your back didn't exist because it aches and pains you. But honey, whether you like it or not, we are still part of the body. Hallelujah. Right. And sometimes... Parts of the body will introduce to us pain. Amen. And that pain is designed to let us know that something is not right. I'm here to tell you today, folks, in the era of Donald Trump, in the era of Republican arrogance, in the era of self-righteousness and pollution and perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand today the word of God declares Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, the Word of God declares, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar or unusual people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hallelujah. God's people today are called to separation. We're called to uniqueness, holiness, godliness, and righteousness. We're called to be a city of light that sets atop a hill, not merely a candle, which can easily be covered by a bushel basket. Therefore, hiding any light that that candle may offer. Listen to me, saints. We are corporately called to be a body of light. Again, a city that is built on a hill. There's a reason Jesus said that ye are the light of the world. A city that is built upon a hill cannot be hid. 
Why did he use the term a city built on a hill? He didn't say a fire on top of a hill or a candle on top of a hill or a light on top of a hill cannot be hid. Why did he say a city built on a hill? Because a city, listen to me now, represents a corporation. It represents a corporate group of people. A city is not comprised of the individual, but it is comprised of many individuals. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So when the Lord said a city that is built upon a hill, he's comparing the church to a corporate body that is supposed to provide light and illumination to the world, not just the individual. You see, each of us as an individual child of God, each of us as an individual believer, we can only provide so much light. Amen. We can only provide so It's like lighting a candle versus lighting a hundred candles on a birthday cake. When you light a whole bunch of candles, all of a sudden the light's a whole lot brighter, isn't it? Well, a city that is built on a hill is a whole lot brighter because you see light coming from every window of all the structures, of all the businesses, and of all the homes, and of all the places of worship, and of all the gathering places. There is light coming from a number of sources. If you've ever flown at night time, then you know as you fly into Dallas, for instance, and you look out the window of that plane, my goodness, it just looks like the ground is lit up, doesn't it? And yet... There are actually millions of individual lights. There's no one singular light that is producing all of that illumination, is there? No. But what you're seeing is you are seeing the light that is produced by millions of individual lights, but those lights are held in a cluster. They are together. They all exist within the confines and within the boundaries of one singular city. If you look at the earth from a space telescope or from a satellite, then you know that you see all kinds of lights on the face of planet earth. Everywhere you look, there are little uh, patches of light, and yet not one of those patches of light that you see, not one of them, listen to me, is created by a singular light source. Not one of them. Every one of those lights that you see from space on the face of planet Earth is the con it's the conglomerate of millions of individual lights. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, a city that is built upon a hill, that's set upon a hill, cannot be hid. Why? Because we are a body. We are not individual believers. You see, one of the biggest problems we have in the church today is this me, myself, and I mindset. Mm -hmm. The me, myself, and I mindset has crept into the world. America is guilty more than any country on the face of planet Earth of the selfish, self-centered me, myself, and I mindset. Amen. We are full of the most selfish, self-centered uh, people that the world could possibly know. We have people today that call themselves Christ Christians. How dare they? And identify as why the only party on planet Earth that represents God and stands by the word of God. The Republican Party, the grand old party. And yet, these same people are so selfish and so lacking in compassion that they have no desire in the universe to help the stranger. They have no desire in the universe to minister to the sick. They have no desire in the universe to be kind to those who are in prison. They have no desire in the universe to care for the poor and the needy among us. 
No, the attitude is I work for mine, you work for yours. I got mine by doing thus and so, and you can get yours by doing thus and so. If I see one more so-called Christian on Facebook or on Twitter come out with an idiotic comment, I worked hard, I worked two jobs, I went to college and I worked my way through, bless God. And if the United States were to start offering free college education to people, am I going to get a refund? Because after all, I had to work hard. Well, that's funny. I grew up in New England. I grew up in a very mountainous region. It was very tough uh, to travel because you were constantly having to travel along uh, mountain sides and you were having to travel uh, over the top of mountains and down below. Now, the little town I grew up in, we had a highway that come right through the center of town and there was one stoplight in the center of our town and that was it. But if you were on that highway, you would travel for miles and miles and miles without any interruptions, without any lights or anything, all of a sudden you'd start coming through our little town and there'd be a stoplight up ahead of you on the highway. Well, the state decided to come in and they decided they were going to enlarge the highway and they were going to reroute it a little bit and they cut through, Tommy, a mountain. They cut right through it. You see, technology had advanced since they built the first highway. Things had gotten better. Uh, they had equipment today that was far more powerful. And they were able to cut through this mountain. And I mean, they literally cut it down, oh, probably a good 200 feet or so. Now the highway was able to travel uh, on a relatively flat path rather than having to go up and down and around like this when around the side of the mountain. We had a road we used to call, Mom, you remember the upper and lower roads. Uh, the upper road traveled north, the lower road traveled south, and it ran along the side of the mountain. And I mean, it was curvy. My goodness. It was crazy. Us young people, when we got our driver's license, and we used to love that upper and lower road. Man, you'd let the gas open up, and you'd tear down that road. Well, of course, when you grew up in that community, you knew every curb before you ever got there, you know. But people died on that highway. A lot of people drove off the, the sides of those mountainous roads, you know, because they were so bendy and curvy. But they changed the highway, and they... They made it slightly over to the uh, west of the old highway, and they cut the mountain right through. Well, gee, I wonder, Booby, if we shouldn't do something to make it harder for people to drive over that new highway... Because after all, I used to have to drive those hard roads. I used to have to drive a path that was up and down and that was side by side and you had to go curving. Why should they be able to travel a flatter path? Why should they be able to travel a road that's flatter and straighter? Idiots. It's called progress. Right. It is called moving forward. Right. It is called uh, enlightenment. We come to a place within our society where we realize that forcing people to have to work like lunatics like you did, sir, was really unfair to you. It, it wasn't fair to you. Right. You should have been able to have put all your energies into your studies. You shouldn't have had to uh, divert your attention between a job or two jobs and your studies. You should have been able to have put all your energies. You know what? You wound up with a GPA of uh, 3.2 when you could have had a 4.0. How many doors could that have opened in your life? How, how could you even, even you who brags about what you accomplished, how many more doors might have been opened to you had the path been made a little bit easier? Had it been made available to you? So instead of griping about what somebody today may get and how much easier things, honey, I remember my grandmother doing laundry when I was a kid. 
Now, some of y'all, you're about to understand how old this preacher is. <laughs> My grandmother used to have an old washing machine. I mean, that thing must have weighed a thousand pounds. And guess where it was? It wasn't in the washroom. It wasn't in a utility room in the house. It was in the backyard. My grandmother would put clothes in that old washing machine and they'd agitate a bit and, and it would push the clothes around a little bit. She couldn't do laundry in bad weather. She couldn't do laundry in the rain. And then she'd have to take article by article of clothing out and she'd feed it through these two look like old-fashioned dough ringers, you know. And she'd, feed, and she'd have to hand crank it and these two wooden big dowels would pull that clothing through and as it did it would squeeze out the water she'd have to do that then she'd have to rinse the clothes then she'd have to squeeze out the water a second time and once she was done with all that listen she didn't just take a basket full of wet clothing and throw it in the dryer and hit the button no she used to then have to go to the line there was rope that my grandfather had erected for her. It was a clothing line, and she'd use clothing pins. Y'all remember that? Some of you folks watching, you remember the old clothes lines? And you'd have to pin your clothes up on the clothes line. And sometime my grandmother had ten children. On my father's side, on my mother's side, on my mother's side there were ten. On my father's side there were twelve. Do you know? Grandma would have to spend, both grandmas would have to spend hours and hours and hours and hours a day just trying to get the clothes dry. Because when you had that many clothes, unless you had thousands of feet of clothing line, which of course a lot of times they would hang several clothing lines up, and you'd have rows of clothing line, but you'd have to hang up as much as you could let the wind and the air blow through it and dry it. Then they pull all that in, and immediately Grandma was hanging up the next round of clothing. Am I telling the truth? Sometimes it could take two days to get laundry done back in the day. So what can we do to make it harder for ladies and men today to do the laundry? Because after all, it's not fair that my grandmother had to work that hard to do laundry. And today there are washing machines in your home. Well, you don't have to go outside. You don't have to bring the clothes through the ringer. You don't have to uh, uh, hang your clothes on the line like you said. What can I do to make it harder? Because it's not fair that folks used to have to do things that way. It's called progress. Let's wake up. Let's quit being so selfish and self-centered. And let's quit thinking of ourselves. And let's think about the next generation and the people who are coming up behind us. As a child of God, if I can make your journey the least bit less complicated, if I can make your journey the least bit more difficult, if I can make your journey uh, the least bit easier, listen, I'm all for that. Amen. As a child of God, I'm all for that. I'm all for universal health care because I know not everybody can get a job that has benefits. Not everybody can get a job that offers Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Hello now. The biggest part of our workforce in America is people who work for places like Walmart and uh, places like this and McDonald's and all of these service industry jobs. And not a one of them, honey, offers any kind of health care benefit. Not a one of them is going to give you Blue Cross Blue Shield. That doesn't mean you're not going to get sick. Well, I'm going to tell you something. When I was a kid, if you, well, not when I was a kid. I have to go a little further back, thank God. Mm. My grandfather would talk of a day when he used to have to follow a horse with a plow. And that horse would pull that plow through the field. And it was hard work. My grandfather, he wasn't riding on nothing, Tommy. He was literally having to walk behind the plow 
And that poor horse would be tugging that plow through the field. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Back in the day, people that owned work animals, if that animal got sick, they went out of their way to take care of that animal and make sure that animal could be well. You know why? Because that animal represented their being able to get stuff done. If that animal was sick, they couldn't get anything done. They couldn't be productive. And my grandfather said, boy, I'll tell you what, back in the day, if you had a horse that was down, I mean to tell you, you'd do everything in your power to get that horse healthy. You'd call in the vet and you'd spend whatever money you had to spend to make sure that that horse was well because that horse can't work if it's sick. Most of us today in America, many of us own automobiles. And I mean to tell you, I know what I'm talking about because I'm going through some more problems today with my car. <sighs> Your car goes down and you can't be productive. You can't get done what you need to do. So you wind up spending whatever you have to spend to get that car working because you need it. You have to have it. Isn't it funny? There was a time in America when, oh, and we're supposed to be making America great again. But right. nobody's talking about going back to the days when factories and employers cared about their employees and understood that the most important thing they had was their employees. Right. And therefore, if their employee was sick or their employee wasn't well, their employee could not be productive. So they made sure that employee had access to a doctor. When I was a kid, my father worked for a factory in New England, in Connecticut. He worked for a copper factory. And do you know that that copper factory had a doctor? Did you hear what I said? My, my father's factory had a doctor. Doctor uh, used to be right next door to the factory. His offices were right next door to the factory. And they had a contract with that doctor. If anything was going on with anybody in that factory or their families, they could send them to that doctor. And we used to go to that doctor. We used to see him. And man, I'll tell you, he'd take care of anything you need to tell you. You know why? Because human resources were the most important resources. That's right. But you know what? Things have changed because of greed and avarice in this country. Things have changed because we're more worried about giving the stockholder who does nothing for the company but put money into it. That's all they do. We don't care about the guy who works his rear end off in order to keep the machinery of the company moving and productive. Those people don't mean anything. We care about the people who put money into the factory, who put money into the industry, who put money into the business. We want to make sure they get the biggest returns. Well, stupid, those people aren't going to get the biggest returns if all these people over here are sick mm -hmm. and unwell. If they're worried about members of their family with cancer, if they're worried about members of their family who are not well. My grandfather worked for a factory in New England, and one day a couple of my, my mother and a couple of her sisters decided they were going to ingest ant buttons. If you don't know what ant buttons are, those are... Little, they almost look like little pieces of candy, and they would put them out, and it was uh, to attract ants, you know, and the ants would come and eat of it, and they would die because they're poison. <laughs> Well, my mother and a couple of her siblings decided they were going to ingest some of these delicious candy-looking ant buttons when they were little. Well, they had to be rushed off to the hospital. This is long before... Back in the, you know, late 40s, early 50s. Sorry, Mom, I'm giving away your age. Long before they had health care coverage of any kind, even to offer to factories, you know. And my grandfather rushed his daughters off to the emergency room, and the emergency room took care of them, and they gave them a bill. And the bill was for a few hundred dollars. And my grandfather said, I went to the... Uh, manager at my plant 
And I went in and I presented the bill to him and I said, listen, uh, my daughter's got into some ant buttons and they poisoned themselves. We had to rush them to the emergency room. They had to have their stomachs pumped and all that, you know, had to swallow some chalk or some, uh, what do they call that? Not chalk, but uh, charcoal in order to absorb the poison or what have you. And... Uh, I got this bill here. He said, is there any way I might possibly get an advance on my pay because I want to get... One thing my grandparents did, they paid every bill they had as soon as they got it. They didn't want any bills, you know, lingering. So he wanted to get it paid immediately. And he asked the manager at his plant, and the manager of the plants called his uh, secretary in, and he said to the secretary, cut Mr. Bell a check for so much, you know. My grandfather said, you can take it out of my next two. You can take it back, my next two paychecks. And this man said, no, sir, Don, I'm not going to do that. Because your next two paychecks, you'd get nothing. He said, you've got a family to feed. You've got house payments to make. He said, no. He said, here's what I want you to do. Every payday, you just come in and give us toward that, whatever you can afford to give us. He said, but don't you worry about it. Take your time, not a problem told the secretary, cut this man, Mr. Bell, a check for this amount. And my grandfather said, if you don't mind, he said, could you just make that check out to Waterbury Hospital and, and that way I don't have to even mess with it. And so they did. Try that today. Try that with your employer today and see how many employers are going to cut a check so you can pay a medical bill. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you today? Things have changed. When things change for the better, my friend, it is called progress. And it is sickening to me that there are so many in the church world today who call themselves children of God, but they are not children of God. They are wolves in sheep's clothing because children of God have fruit in their lives that helps the world to know that they are light. Right. And not darkness. Mm -hmm. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Um, if you're not seeing the fruit of the Spirit, then the Spirit is not present. Because where the Spirit is, the fruit is. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Amen. And if the Spirit's not present, then they have not been baptized into the one body that is the body of Christ. We're all individuals, and yet we're called collectively as the body of Christ to be the light of the world. There is a reasoning behind the call to Follow peace or pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord according to the word of God. And the reasoning for this mandate is not, it is not at all what we often hear preached in churches and what we hear generally presented. If we as the body of Christ, each individual members in particular pursue godliness and holiness in our lives then we function listen to me children this is important we function as a healthy cell within the body which in turn helps other cells which may be less healthy than ourselves to defeat temptation to overcome sin, to rise above unbelief, and to raise themselves to a higher level of godliness and righteousness. And what does this accomplish? It thus brightens our collective light and causes our corporate flame to burn brighter, stronger, and more vividly. Everything I do, my brother and sister in Christ, I do for you. Hello. Did you hear what I said today? The title of my message, Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Who was it? Meatloaf sang the song? Was it? Or somebody else? I'm not, I'm not as big on 
popular music as Tommy is. Do you know who it was? Uh, Brian Adams, I think. Brian Adams sang the song, Everything I Do, I Do It For You. I love that song. I thought it was a beautiful song. But you see, as a child of God, everything we do, we do it not necessarily for ourselves, but we do it for others. We do it for the benefit and the health and the well-being of our fellow brother and sister in Christ. We do it as a testimony, as a witness to the unsaved, to those who are outside in the world. We do it for the Lord. Everything I do, I do for somebody. I'm either doing it for the Lord, I'm doing it for my fellow believer, or I'm doing it for the unbeliever. But there's very little that I do that I do for me. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I'm a member of the body of Christ. As a member of the body of Christ, if I work to make certain that every cell around me is healthy and well, then I keep the lamp burning bright, and I keep the light shining bright. But if I, as a child of God, get into this me, myself, and I mindset, and all I think about, all I care about is myself, and I don't function with the thought of my brother and my sister in the faith, then what happens is, if I'm unhealthy, they become unhealthy. If they're unhealthy, they become more unhealthy because they're not surrounded by healthy cells. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And then the entire body begins to become toxic. Toxic. And the light that should be burning bright is growing dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. If you look at the body of Christ, if you look at the church in America today, it is not shining as it ought to be shining. It is not as bright as it ought to be bright. Why? Because there are leaders and there are individuals in the church who are false apostles, who are false leaders, who are false Christians. And like a cancer, they're infecting the rest of the body. A believer who lives unto himself or herself without thought or concern for the spiritual well-being of his or her brother or sister in Christ, is not following the mandate of God's Word, neither are they fulfilling the will of God for the church universal. In John chapter 15, verses 8 through 14, Jesus our Lord declares, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Not just bear fruit, but bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Listen, verse 12, John 15. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. A man laid down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. We've got people who never mind lay down their life for someone else. They don't even want another dollar to take it out of their paycheck uh, that might help their neighbor get health care. They don't even want another dollar or two taken out of their paycheck that might help their neighbor or their fellow believer get a college education so that they can achieve more and accomplish more and have more in this life in the way of success and prosperity. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, the church is far, far, far from being where it ought to be. And I hope to God if you're under the sound of my voice today that you are learning and understanding we are the body of Christ corporately. We provide light for the world. Individually, we can accomplish very little. 
We have to work together. We have to do things as God has ordained that they do things. I do many things so that my siblings in Christ can see my example. I do not do other things, not because I couldn't, but because the weaker believer beside me could not safely do those things. Are you listening to me now? In deference and out of concern for their well-being, I avoid anything that might cause them to stumble. I don't drink alcohol. Do I not drink alcohol? Because if I put an alcoholic drink to my lips, I'm going to split hell wide open. Well, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. Yes, sir, that's the answer. That's what my pastor preached. That's what the pastor of the church I go to preaches. If you put alcohol to your lips, you're going to hell. That's stupid. That's stupid. The Apostle Paul told Timothy to have a little wine for his stomach's sake. He literally instructed Timothy to drink a little alcohol. Don't give me that foolishness that alcohol in and of itself is wicked and evil. No, the Word of God warns us, folks, that alcohol can be a very negative, a very destructive influence in our body and in our lives. You can compromise your testimony as a child of God by drinking and getting drunk and then turning around and doing something stupid that if you were in control of yourself, if you were sober, you would never have done. And then your testimony goes down the toilet. The Word of God said, casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. As a child of God, I don't need alcohol. I don't need to medicate myself with alcohol. I don't need to use a booze in order to calm my nerves. I don't need to use booze in order to escape the reality of the struggle I'm going through at this hour. I don't need it. Why? Because I have Jesus. But why does Pastor Charles not drink alcohol? Because if I have a glass of wine with dinner, I'm going to hell. Because if I have a glass of wine with dinner, the devil's going to come claim my soul. No. Everything I do, I do it for you. Because there are some among us who couldn't have that one glass of alcohol without it being a, a, a slippery slope. And before too long, they'd be right back to drunkenness and abandon. They'd be out of control. And do you follow what I'm telling you now? So what I do, I do as an example. What I do, I do in deference to my fellow believer. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Same thing with drugs. Same thing with uh, 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 illicit sexual conduct. Everything I do, I do for my fellow believer. It's my job to set an example. The Word of God, Paul the Apostle, told Timothy. He said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example unto the believers. So he's even telling Timothy, who was young, don't let your conduct be such that others look at you and say, oh, brother, he's young. He's acting stupid. He's acting the fool. But Paul's telling Timothy, even in his youth, but be an example unto the believers. What am I telling you, Timothy? I'm telling you, Timothy, everything you do, do for somebody else. Do as an example. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Tommy will tell you. Anybody who's known me for any length of time will tell you, I don't wear jewelry. I have a wedding ring. I do not wear jewelry. I wear plastic watches. I've worn these for decades. I've bought Casio uh, plastic, you know, handled watches, or, or not handled, but what do they call that, bands. I do this on purpose. I do this on purpose, folks. You know why I do this? Because there's all kinds of television preachers out there who are living the me, myself, and I mentality. And if they want to have a Rolex, bless God, they'll have a Rolex. And I believe it's insane for a preacher of the gospel to be up there preaching with a Rolex watch that costs more than some people's cars when there are people watching him preach who are hungry and who are struggling. I've told Tommy, I said, be careful 
about what you post on social media. You know, a lot of people love to post on social media pictures of food they've made and of new cars they bought and all these things. And we love to share our successes. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do this, but I'm saying be careful. Don't go, don't become obsessive with it. Don't, don't, uh, you know, do it constantly. There was a time in my life, folks, when I went through some really difficult circumstances. I mean hard circumstances. And some of these times don't go back too far. I mean, they go back 20, 20 years or so. I've been at the place where I had no food, where I had no money for food where I was struggling like you can't even believe. The last thing in the world I needed was to be looking on my phone, if I, had, if I was blessed enough to have a phone, and see images of all these wonderful meals that people have prepared. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Now, we don't make a habit of doing that, do we? But do we, do, do we not make a habit of it because if we do so, we're going to hell? If we do so, but no, no, that's not it. Everything I do, I do it for you. I think about others in every decision I make. I understand people are struggling. I understand right now that people are having a hard time with this pandemic going on and what have you. Therefore, every decision I make, I make with others in mind. Do you follow what I'm saying today? If I do post something, if I do say something, if I do share something, I try to frame it in such a manner as to encourage others to do good and to encourage others to do the right thing. If I share something, I share it as a blessing from God and I help other people to understand, I believe if you'll do right and you'll act right and you'll live right and you'll walk right, that God will bless you and he'll help you. So so that you too can be blessed as I'm being blessed right now. I'm being blessed because I give. I'm a giver by nature. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a giver. Therefore, if God gives back to me, then I share that. Why? As an example. Folks, I'm telling you right now, if you'll give, God will give back. God don't owe nobody nothing. You can't outgive God. So, I don't do certain things, not because I couldn't do it, but because the weaker believer beside me could not do those same things without stumbling and falling. I avoid anything that might cause my brethren to stumble. Amen. Let me see. The well-being of our fellow believer... It is important to me. We are a body. We are not, we're not individually out there living for God. We're not out there individually serving God. We are a body. We are a city that is built upon a hill. We are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen generation. All of these terms speak to cooperation. All of these terms speak to cooperation. All of these terms speak to the concept of a body. Now listen, love is measured by one's concern for another and willingness to put others before ourselves. The Lord made this clear when he said in John 15, 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. In Romans 14, 12 through 19, the Word of God tells us, Paul the Apostle writes to the church at Rome, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Judgment will be individual. However, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. 
But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably or in love? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things, listen, wherewith one may edify another. Also to the Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 12, verses 9 through 21, I'm almost done today. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another, meaning putting one another first, or putting one another ahead of yourself. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wives in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of head, excuse me, coals of fire. On his head. Listen, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Are you seeing the concept today? Everything I do, I do it for you. Everything I do, I do it for you. I'm, I'm either doing it for my fellow believers' benefit, or I'm doing it for the unbelievers' benefit, or I'm doing it for my Heavenly Father. But honey, it's all about, as a child of God, living for others. Our lives ought to be given in the interests of others. We're supposed to set an example. We're supposed to care. We're supposed to give. If a, if a member of the body is without necessary supplies we're supposed to supply when Johnny and Bill I went to visit them even in this uh, pandemic situation I ran by there the spirit of the Lord laid on my heart to give our church members a little bit of money somebody blessed me with some money and I felt the Lord lay on my heart to give a hundred dollars to each of some of our people, and uh, well, to all of our local people and to some of our people online who have been following this ministry for years. And I feel like they're part of our church. And I went to Johnny and Bill so I could bring them this. And when I did, they told me about a man that they knew personally who had just lost his home and was literally having to live in the woods. His home was literally taken right out of underneath him. And he was living in the woods. He had a car, but he was living in the woods and was having to live homeless. And this man had asked if anybody had a cooler that he might 
could have or use. And so I came to the house and I knew I had a couple of coolers around. I forgot that I brought one or two of them up to our property in Oklahoma. And so I got to the house, I'm looking around for a cooler. The only one I had was my good one that had wheels and had a handle that comes up. And that was the only cooler I had available at the house. It was basically brand new, you know, it's in excellent condition. And I said to Tommy, I said, well, if you're not willing to give your best away, you're not willing to give anything away. Amen. It's not about, it's not about, well, I'll give away what's the worst I've got. It's no, hey, you give, if there's a need, you give. I told Bill and Johnny, I said, give me a little bit. I'll be right back in a minute. I'm going to get the cooler I've got. I said, I'm sure I've got at least one. I'm going to get it. I'm going to bring it back to you, and then uh, you can bring it to this gentleman. I filled that cooler up with a whole bunch of canned goods. I put some bottled water in there. I put some garbage bags because, you know, if you're going to be living out the way this poor guy's living, he needs a way to throw away his garbage and what have you. I put some paper plates in there, some plastic spoons and what have you, and some plastic cups. And, I mean, I put all kind of supplies in that cooler and uh, put some other things together. And I brought it over back to Johnny and Bill, and I said, here you go. Now you bring this to that man and you tell him this we do in Jesus name because everything I do I do it for you that's how God's people ought to live their lives that's how we I don't say that to glorify myself I say that as an example to the believers do you follow what I'm saying today I talked about the fact that a while back I'm trying to close up I have one more short passage I want to read to you in a second Tommy and I used to go to Denny's fairly frequently after church. Some of our church folks would go with us to Denny's. There's a homeless man, heavy set, a little bigger than I am, or bigger than I was. I've lost a few pounds since then. And one day it was extremely cold outside, and this homeless man was sitting in Denny's. He often would be there, just drinking a cup of coffee. He didn't always, I guess, have money for a meal, I don't know, but I had helped him at times. I gave him gift cards to McDonald's and Denny's and what have you, try to help him eat. A lot of times, folks, here's an idea. If you see somebody who's homeless or uh, what have you, uh, buy them a gift card at McDonald's. Don't give them cash, you know, because they can go spend it on alcohol or whatever. Go buy them a gift card at McDonald's or Wendy's or something and give them the gift card and tell them how much is on it so they can buy some food. I do that frequently as well when I have the money. I, I'm not rich, so that isn't often. This man's sitting, and he has no coat. It's freezing outside. I mean, it was freezing freezing outside, probably the coldest day of the year nearly. And I asked him, I said, where's your coat? He said, it was stolen. He said, somebody stole my coat. I said, oh dear Lord, you're kidding. So listen, you stay right here. I'll be back in a minute. Thank God Tommy and I only live about, oh, five, six blocks away from the Denny's or so. So I said, you stay right here. I'll be right back. I came to the house my favorite coat in the entire world was this great big uh, camouflage hooded coat, had fur like inside the, the hood, and it was the warmest coat because it's made for like hunting and that sort of thing. I mean, this booger was so warm and so cuddly, but it was also about a size or two too big for me. But I wore it because I loved it. It was so cozy. I wore that thing and I loved it. Beautiful coat. And I came home and I pulled it out of the closet. And Tommy said, are you going to give him that? Isn't that your favorite coat? I said, yeah. I said, but he's got a need far greater than my need. He's cold. It's cold. If he's going to be homeless, he don't need to be homeless out in this freezing cold. He can use this coat. He was bigger than I was, so I knew this coat would fit him better than any other coat I could have given him. So I brought him that coat. I went back and gave him that coat. Folks, I want to tell you today, as God's people, everything I do, I do it for you. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, I'm ending right now. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, meaning encouraging one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Child of God, if you live your life as though you are the highest priority in your world, you're not living your life according to God's design. You're not living your life the way God would have you to live it. I'm telling you the truth today. Everything I do, I do it for you. We're to be mindful of one another. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. Any light that we have in the world is amplified by the fact we are a body. One candle provides little light compared to bringing together hundreds or thousands or millions of candles. God's people provide the light for the world. We become a city built on a hill which cannot be hid when we come together corporately, when we function as a body, if we are functioning as individuals, if we're all living our lives as though uh, our walk with God is between us and God and it has nothing to do with anybody else. And my life is my life and it has nothing to do with anybody else. My money is my money and it has nothing to do with anybody else. If we live like this, folks, we are failing to do the work of God and we're failing to live as God would have us live our motto ought to be as children of God as believers as saints of the most high everything I do I do it for you hallelujah